Good morning, good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a new edition of uh, the G1 Healthcare Providers webinars that we organize on a bi-monthly basis. So first of all, I would like to thank you for your interest and we hope that you will be able to take away some learnings from today's webinar about transforming the sterile goods supply chain and introducing traceability to legacy items. We will have the opportunity to zoom into a critical area that has an important place in most medical centers and healthcare providers. The central sterilization rooms are known, are known uh, to the medical staff as the factories where sterilized products that will be used for diagnosis, cure or treatment of patients are made or are refurbished. So before moving to the presentation, I would like to briefly remind you the competition low caution and under which all G1 meetings are operated. So let me just, sorry, wait a minute. Let me just read it. The best way to avoid problems is to remember that the purpose of the group is to enhance the ability of all industry members to compete more efficiently. This means there shall be no discussion of prices, allocation of customers, products, boycotts, refusals to deed or market share. If any participant believes that the group is drifting toward impermissible discussion, the topic shall be tabled until the opinion of counsel can be obtained. So if you need more information uh, or read it in, in its entirety, please go uh, through the link that we are uh, posted below on this slide. So having said that, we are pleased today to introduce and welcome uh, Henry Castilli, today's speaker. He's a lead architect for item identification, logistics, and tracking at Central Denmark region that will share his experience today on the process of implementing a full flow traceability system for sterile flow management at Godstrup Regional Hospital. I have during the Q&A uh, session that will take place just after his uh, presentation. And now I give the floor directly to you, Henrik, so you can start wherever you want. Thank you very much. Well, uh, first of all, thanks for having me back. I presented here back in uh, 2016. And having done that, we went through a lot of the standards that we cho uh, chose to use in the Central Denmark region. Um, and since we have done that before, I'm not really going to go that deep into the different named standards. I'm going to tell you the story of how we make the information flow within the sterile goods supply process. Next slide, please. And actually, I believe GS1 Ireland has made a very good illustration of this. Because what we are trying to do is to take the GS1 standards and make them talk. And by that, I mean that every item has its own role, it has its own capability, and by choosing the correct way of identifying that item, you can put it into your flow and you can gain a lot of uh, um, good things doing a digital transformation. For us, that was a digital transformation coming from a legacy situation where everything was made by pen and paper to a situation where we actually only use the paper as a, a backup solution. Next slide, please. As Monica said, I'm the lead architect for the central Denmark region, and I would like to apologize for selecting the hospital, with, which probably has the most difficult name to pronounce in, in English. Uh, in Danish, it's Regions uh, Hospitale Gødstrup, and I will not try to make any of you say that name. Um, in Denmark, we have consolidated our public health services on larger emergency hospitals. Uh, and in the central Denmark region, uh, we have five hospitals uh, now supplying that kind of service. Next slide, please. I've spoken a lot about the traceability solutions at Aarhus University Hospital. They have been a first mover and we have a, a fairly large installation using GS1 standards for uh, tracking and tracing. In Gerstrup, we have another situation there we were moving into an entirely new hospital and what we would like to do at that site was to create a, 
100% digital supply situation for the sterile goods. Next slide, please. We had our first patient last year in February, and we have about 2,000 patients a day at, at that hospital, uh, taken care of by the 4,000 great employees. And not to go too deeply into the facts, the one thing I'd like you to uh, pay attention to here, because that's going to come back to us during the presentation, is that we have 3,750 individual sterile goods product split out over 6,000 individual serial numbers. So that actually means that we have to dig into this pile of uh, instruments and find exactly the right one for the right patient. And we're doing that uh, 365 days a year. Next slide, please. We didn't make the task any easier by creating a central sterile service department and placing it away from the operating rooms, which was a totally different situation for the staff because they were used to having all the equipment right next to uh, to the operating rooms. And actually, a lot of the communication was just people talking to each other, making sure that every process was uh, handled correctly. Next slide, please. We moved it 350 meters away from the operating rooms, and that gave us a situation where our main KPI for delivery changed to a 40 minute situation where we had practically been able to go from the operating room down to the uh, sterilization department and get what we wanted uh, or uh, asking them to to speed up the process if they had to and and how do you do that well that's what we're going to dig into next slide please we were trying to move away from what we call a structural situation. The railway is my best example of something structural. You can do the same thing with a very high throughput, but you are also locked into the to doing uh, what your track allows you to do. We were going like, would like to go into a situation where each um, uh, patient is treated individually, and we could make decision changes on what to do and how to do it very fast. Next slide. It's uh, Historically, it's said that you cannot handle what you cannot see. And that's what we, we're trying to mitigate today. Next slide, please. So going from these old fashioned large ward rooms into single uh, patient rooms, requires that you start modeling a lot of information. And you have to create a common shared language describing what's going on in the hospital. So you're going to get into trouble if you don't name your rooms, your assets, actually also your, uh, your procedures the same way across all level uh, of staff. And to be digital and to have that background Next slide, please. You need to do a lot of manual work. The work to find the correct names for the rooms, to make an information structure describing the hospital that were intuitive both for staff and patient, started five years ago, actually trying to see which concepts were functioning well in other hospitals and, and what should we try to avoid and what had not been solved yet. And the product of that is actually that we today, we have a database, it's for the entire region, but for Gerstel, could you change the slide please? We have a hospital now where it's split in to more than 7,000 digital entities. That's rooms, that's uh, uh, areas where you wait for, uh, for your consultation. And um, it's also a, an image that shows exactly where all the technical equipment in the hospital uh, is mounted. On top of that, we use that model to, you, to combine it with sensors. Next slide. These sensors are placed throughout the hospital to make sure that um, we have the ability to automatically track when important assets move around in the hospital. 
these pictures are actually from Aarhus University Hospital. Um, it's a bit more hidden in the way it's been installed in Gustav, so I ch uh, chose to take the pictures from Aarhus to show that we placed RFID readers in a gated infrastructure so that we know if a trolley is placed in either one or another zone. And that becomes important for, for the staff who needs to know if we are on track to be able to operate and do surgery on a, on a patient. Actually, if you look uh, on the floor on the big picture here, you can see you have some uh, markings on the floor and that tells the staff that when you're crossing that line, you're going from one zone to another and that the rest of the hospital now knows that you, you have moved your assets into the next zone because they can go in and get that information digitally. Next slide, please. We present this information at the point where it's relevant. We have a co two coordinators here trying to, to get ready for an operation. And at the next level, the two nurses are prepping uh, to have a, a patient into the room. They have the exact same information about where assets are in the hospital from so this uh, automated uh, solution. So they know if we are on track or we are off track. And that's a great help. Um, before we moved into the new hospital and before we introduced this um, at Aarhus University Hospital, the only way to know if something was on track was to get hold of the one who was respons responsible by calling them on a phone. And they could tell if the sterile goods were on track to be delivered at the right time. That took a lot of time. And a lot of times we need, we had to postpone or we were overly uh, um, uh, conservative with how much many assets we had to have uh, ready at a given time. And it made a lot of things slower. And actually uh, the security level, the, the, uh, the level of knowledge we have of when we were ready to handle the patient was was at a much lower level than we have today. Next slide. As I said, this is not the story about how we uh, technically uh, introduce this traceability. We've told that one before, but just to let you know, we're using uh, passive RFID tags with the RFID system, and that gives us. Uh, thousands of events each hour telling what's been changing in the hospital. And to us, one of the things that actually, it was not that surprising because we, we had done simulations before we started uh, um, building the new hospitals, but we are still surprised at how many things actually move around with actually very few uh, staff members. So today I cannot even imagine how we at some point thought that we could call someone and that it could give us the correct picture of what's going on inside the hospital. Next slide. One thing that's very important to remember is that this is a system. The first picture here, that's the sign on the door of the co coordinating nurse in the uh, operating uh, uh, department. The second picture, that's from the centralized sterilization department. And the last picture, that's actually a very close, close up picture of a data matrix code on a single instrument. And you don't need one system to give the head nurse the possibility to know which instruments are available because it's been registered in, in the sterilization department, how far ahead they are, uh, how close they are to being ready for the next operation. That's not one system, but that's one family of standards delivering the information across these areas of responsibility. The next slide is going to be a bit heavy on information. Um, and I hope you'll go back into this one later because I'm going to be a, a bit brief on it. But we have several things that makes this process um, uh, complicated. First of all, 
we moved all the main part of our sterile goods into a central storage. Secondly, we needed some of these uh, goods to be mobile. It's not always the same room for the same procedure. So we had to have forward storage in the mobile units to be able to move uh, goods very fast to uh, uh, different situations. And when we have a, a certain level of local storage of um, uh, uh, items that have been used off, and how do you handle that we both have single use items and we have um, um, reuse uh, uh, instruments and in implants, for instance. Well, what we set out uh, and made the decision to do is to say that, well, an object is an object. We classify the different objects into groups based on their capabilities. And then we did something that, that a lot of people uh, second uh, guessed us on uh, starting out because we said, well, if you can order something, it's a trade item. As we said, if it walks like a duck and it talks like a duck, it might be a duck. And what do I really mean by this? This is one of the most important messages today. We took every asset that we deliver into the operating room and went through all the supporting methods around the global trade item number and the logistic process about moving trade items around and found that the elements we need to maintain a high level of quality of quality was in that was was described there we could individually identify each project a product down to a serial uh, number level we knew that we could mark which batch of reprocessing through the centralized service station department where are we in we could put enter production date and in a region like ours where we actually share our instruments between hospitals we add information about the location where something has been produced so what some people believe is problematic and tedious the identification part of the uh, medical device regulation in Europe. We took that and turned it around and said, this is going to be the driver because if so many people found out that this is the right way to do it, how can we take down the standards of the shelf and then introduce that and say, well, we are not going to do something new here. We are going to do something that's well proven. And actually, if we go to the, the please stay on the slide, to the next part here, well, we, uh, one slide back, please. Yeah, we have so many different scenarios where we deliver where we deliver these things. It can be planned. It could be an emergency. We can need alternatives if we have run out of a given asset. We can prepare things that we don't know is going to happen. And this picture is ever changing, and this is changing on a daily level. So, to be able to maintain a high, maintain a high quality, we need this to be flexible. And we need it to be knowledge based and the rules of how you change trade items. And how you maintain the traceability on trade items were applicable on almost all the. Uh, uh, the questions that we need needed to answer to, to have everything moved. Well, we splitting up the operating rooms from the sterilization department and creating a digital picture that people could work from. Next slide, please. So we used basic terms. We are talking about booking. If you want to book a, a seat in a theater, you know there's only a limited number of seats available. We took the same methods and put into our instruments and saying, well, we only have so many available. So if you want to watch this movie, do this kind of procedure, well, you have so many seats to choose from you have only have so, so so many instruments and we and we are sold out we're sold out and to get the hospital flying we are having a preparation cards and checklists to make sure that we know that every time we do something it's repeatable and at the same level of quality just to, in the same way that a pilot uh, starts out before his plane takes off uh, next slide please 
and capacity and demand are not always best friends. When, you, when you're preparing the instruments in the central sterilization department, you don't really know anything else than what's the right quality um, and what's the way that I need to prepare this set of instruments. If you look at the uh, picture at the top right corner, you will see here that there are some red markings. This is a 24 hour ahead perspective telling us that, well, we have bookings for instruments that are not yet ready and that we are actually not on track to have them available at the right time. And the um, managers at the sterilization department go into these pictures and then they have two possibilities. Well, they can track down the instruments and see, is it realistic that we would be able to fast track this situation and uh, solve the problem? Or do we need to take uh, contact into the um, coordinators at the operating department and tell them that this is simply not going to be available. You need to prioritize because we are overbooked or you have overbooked. And the reason why this is acceptable that we cannot plan everything, well, that's because we are an emergency response hospital. Um, at the lower left side is actually uh, a list of demands from uh, from a single day uh, in, the, in the storage unit. And this is a priority list telling the staff which operation should, should you pick a delivery for first. And all this is coordinated so you don't start out something that's not uh, possible to fulfill. Next slide, please. And this is event-based. So we are talking about picking, we're talking about shipping to a different location. And when we're using the automated uh, uh, tracking system, we're talking about observing where something is and when something has arrived. And we commission and decommission uh, assets into this system. And the trained eye will by now see that, well, this is basically things that we just took from the core business vocabulary and said, well, we don't want to invent new terms for this, we might as well do something that's been very well uh, developed and tested uh, during uh, through in um, other um, other areas like uh, retail and logistics before we started to started using them. Next slide, please. So when something happens, for instance, if something's uh, uh, has been washed in the sterilization department, if something has been added to an instrument set for delivery, or if a trolley arrives at a different point. Well, if you combine that with, with rules, well, then we can tell staff what's the required action at this point. And we're mostly doing that at a, a reactive level where they uh, seek out the information, but we uh, in some cases, we are actually changing status and um, supplying the information to the staff uh, directly based on the events. For instance, if we have uh, a, a, a backlog of trolleys that are ready to be cleaned, well, that's something that we, we show on large screens so that they can, they can move on and, and do what needs to be done so that things the instruments don't get destroyed because they have to, have to be cleaned within a, a certain time. Next slide, please. And we like to um, to refer to this as introducing transparency. Again, you see the two pictures here uh, that I showed you before, and I've added some graphs from our business intelligence system here. What you see at the, on the top graph is actually how many single lines are picked from orders each month. And we deliver uh, more than 23,000 lines. That's 23,000 different products each month. And this is not telling us how many of each item is, uh, is being delivered. And I know the graph at the, the lower right corner is not, not very readable, but I actually like this picture very much because this is a merge of all the 3,750 different items and when they were delivered. And as you might see from these graphs fluctuating up and down, some things are not used on a monthly basis. So you need 
to have an information system telling you, do you need to go in and uh, and refurbish these instruments so that you don't deliver something that's uh, run out over date? So in the next slide, we come to what we actually I think is 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 the interesting part here because this is where I when I meet people they say we. How could you do that? How could you achieve this? Well, we have a lot of instruments and usually they don't come back very uh, well ordered from a percentage of our surgeries. Most of the time, everything is uh, well coordinated and you know that we have a set of instruments, you have exactly the right instruments. At other times, and the higher the level of emergency, the higher the probability that things are getting mixed up, we just get a bucket of instruments back down and well, how do you make, how do you find out which one of these 3,750 uh, products do they belong to? And to make everything worse, we put everything into uh, containers so you cannot see what's in inside each container. Next slide, please. And we uh, supply, uh, we add some uh, single use item into this and some of them comes back to the storage and need to be put it correctly back in into storage. So actually right now we have what, it's a bit of a mess when you're an outsider and come into it, but it, luckily we have a, a very well-educated staff that handles this. And on top of this, on the next slide, this is Susanna Jacobsen. She's head of the uh, Centralized Sterilization Service Department. She's standing in front of our first chaos storage unit. So actually when something is ready to use, you can just place it on any one of these shelves and register which shelf it's on then this system will tell back to the one who needs to pick an instrument set of instruments, which one is the correct one to use, which one has been on the shelf the longest time. And then you go to the shelf, not using a system to keep ordering this, because that's one of the things we found out. If you introduce this structural order of where we place the instrument, you need much more storage space. And this is where on the next slide, we come to one of the main concepts. And I know a lot of you might be um, uh, a bit scared. Please uh, change the slide. When I start talking about uh, digital twins, but we have a lot of assets and um, important objects in the hospital that actually only exist digitally. Well, a booking, that's not something firstly you can do, go out and find. I might have a bag of, of what would be the correct set of instruments for a booking if the uh, IT systems should uh, uh, be unavailable. Picking, well, that's a recording of, of actions around some instruments. Transporting where you are, what uh, what your purpose are, is also something that's digitally. Preparing, you need the data to be sure to do the correct things. And at the hospitals, we calculate what we call a fast track priority by seeing how close are we to uh, running out of the different instruments. And to be able to do that and, and have this digital picture, we need to be able to identify all the items. And the requirements is on the next slide. We needed to be able to mark instruments that were liable to end up in this uh, chaos situation where they're just returned without uh, without us being able to correlate with the sets they uh, origin from. So we wanted to mark all our existing instruments of which some are to my, the best of my knowledge uh, uh, up to 20 years old. So we, there were no expectancy from our point of view that, that we could just change instruments and buy new ones that would fit into this system. So we would like to mark without harming physically. We want it to be scalable, scalable global, unique, and easy to use. And we needed to put it on the existing inventory. Next slide, please. There are different standards for this. And we actually went with uh, a method called laser annealing because we found that to be uh, the most precise because it, it, we could use the smallest size of uh, marking and it uh, had the best durability. Next slide, please. And we went out and bought equipment to mark uh, our existing uh, instruments. And uh, as of today, I can see that we have uh, 
marked more than 8,000 instruments uh, in this way. And this is done by the CCSD staff. It, it requires a bit of training, but what it most of all requires is a lot of mythology. It's not that difficult to learn, but it's difficult to keep a high quality on if you're not very tedious in the way that you handle this task. You don't need to, to select the same sort of equipment that, that we have done to do this, but I believe that you need to, uh, to respect uh, the goals that we had when we selected the way we wanted to market. Next slide, please. And we had to do a bit of innovation. And for instance, to mark uh, um, high volumes of instruments, well, we have this uh, three axis machine that can mark uh, up to 42 uh, elements at the time in the way that we have used it. Actually, it could do a lot more, but for us, that's the level. We can re resize and make sure that we fit the data matrix codes on a good place in the instrument so it's readable and it's um, and it's not in any way harming the capabilities of the instruments and when we start marking well the machine handles uh, everything from that point and on next slide please and some things can't be marked so we introduced these uh, we, uh, on the right side we have what we call doc tags that we can uh, uh, fasten on uh, difficult uh, uh, stuff, for instance, like uh, wires and tubes and so, uh, or we uh, add what we call an ID marker to uh, to a set. Next slide. And here it's very important to to understand that the barcodes, from our point of view, always identify the item that they are placed on. So the barcode on the red plate here, that tells us that that is a barcode on a red plate. But through our method of maintaining quality, we know that this red plate is delivered together with the wire that you can see in the background of the picture. So when we scan the plate, we know that we have the plate and the wire. And that's actually the old fashioned way of delivering sterile goods, but we are pretty good at that. Up front, so this has just been an addition to that concept, helping us a lot. Next slide, please. Well, it's hard work, and there's a lot of work to be done here. And if you want to add value for the patient at this process, well, you have to do an investment on the sterilization part of this, and you have to be aware that this is a new language, and transparency cannot be achieved if you try to hide bad processes or if you're doing something that you're not really that proud of. So, so you have to be honest about what your problems are. And most of the time, from my experience, well, if you're honest throughout the entire flow, well, people respect that you have a problem and they sometimes might even have a solution for it. And the 6,259 marked instrument, that's what I can see is in the flow today, but I can see that we have, uh, Done a lot more marking than that, and that's only for uh, uh, the regional hospital at Gustav. We have uh, plenty of more instruments in the four other hospitals. Next slide, please. When we had to, we came from two different hospital sites, and we said uh, one of the plans for us was to move into the new hospital in one day for each site. And this is not 24 hours I'm talking about. No, this is one work day. So we would move patients, slowing down production a week before, move patients from one side to another and be ready to go within the minute that we said that the hospital was open. Next slide. So how, what, how does the standards help us here? Well, we could prepare data months in advance and the staff could see where they needed to plan intermediate flows. Does an asset need to be at one side or the other side at a given time? Or do we need to have it uh, where we have a picture of being in transit? And then we did one of the tricks. I'd, I'm not quite sure if GS1 would recommend this, but what we found out is when we had to move stuff away, if you scan a, an item and we scan a ship to location number barcode, we could actually send the event to the 
the system behind it saying, well, now we are moving away from the old site. When the item then arrived at the new site, we scanned it, telling it that this item is now at the physical location of the new site. And actually then digitally, it was in the asset pool of the new, uh, of the new site. And I have to be honest, stuff got lost in that process, but we had a 100% picture of what had been shipped off and what had been arrived. So we, we know exactly what to go out and look for. Next slide, please. Does that make for a better hospital? I, I, I hope so, but it also makes for a, a hospital that a, 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 has a lot more complexity to it. So you have to make sure that you plan this and you try it out. We had done studies on how to handle these processes for two to three years up to the point where we, we started introducing a full flow situation. Next slide, please. And isn't it just running up CSSD costs? Well, no and yes, but it's an investment in better care. Um, when you grow, you need to replicate what you're doing. And this ability to repeat yourself is, to me, what quality is all about. Because if you can repeat what you're doing, you can know what's been done wrong and what's uh, been done well, and then act upon that. And actually, when we talk to the very experienced staff at CSSD, they are not really that keen on introducing barcodes and scanning. And so at first, because this is a very disruptive process going from a highly knowledge-based process uh, that actually is, was working pretty well to a situation where the system carries knowledge and you don't always know what you're introduced to. But as we move into the other end of the staff, newcomers, well, then we have flattened the learning curve. When you scan something, you get the exact product and information you need. Visual inspections, which we have used a lot, used a lot might fail. And the less experienced you are, the higher the risk of failing at what you're doing is. So you give uh, some kind of comfort to the people using the scanning, say, well, if it tells me this is correct, I've done what I should. And then what the markings we had on the instrument are usually reference numbers. And they are ambiguous. You can have two products where you cannot see if it's a first, second, or third generation of that product. If when the one moment you start using the barcodes, well, you know exactly where you are. And you get a cleaner picture. Next slide, please. At the end of the day, we're doing this for the patient. So of course we are doing more work. Everyone is doing that when they're trying to improve. And we yeah. And I know this this might be a bit cheap because we've been working on this for 12 to 15 years, but this is basically, basically just orchestrating logistic standards. And for the staff, a scan is just pushing a button. Well, it uh, there are some tactile parts to it and you need to train it, but it is a small step. But handling thousands of scans and RFID events, well, that's a giant leap. And that's a giant leap into a transparency that makes for a better hospital, in my opinion. And remember to inspect your data, because when everything is, uh, uh, everything is nice and you've gotten, and your processes are working, you tend to forget to look at what you could improve. So you need to plan for evaluation. You need, you don't just do this, you take time to reflect. And again, the reason we, why we reflect is because this is all about the patient. Next slide, please. Well, what's next? We would very much like to introduce global master data. I haven't said this, but we just built on the databases that, that we had before. And actually that meant going from paper into um, a digital database. We would very much like for new products coming into the hospital to just represent themselves with a full set of metadata from global uh, master data repositories. We had to make workarounds, of course. We built a new hospital. We didn't know everything that would go wrong, go, go be good and what would be bad. And, and we, we introduced some workarounds and we'd like to weed out these workarounds uh, over time. 
we are not at the desired level of transparency yet. We, and one of the reasons for that is that we'd like to have a lot more mobility in the placement of, um, of the sterile goods. Today, we are still working on the old method where everything has a, a fixed place. Storage-wise, it belongs in a, a, a storage room before it needs to be um, used, or a mobile storage unit, or a local storage uh, close to the operating room. We would very much like that to be a requirement-based, prioritized uh, model where you continuously move uh, the sterile goods closer to the place where they're going to be used. Uh, also to make sure that we don't um, have things that run out on date in one storage when it could have been used in another storage. And we need to continuously evaluate the instrument pool. We know that 3,750 sets are too high a level. Now we can go in and see what's the usage level and do we have stuff that actually complement each other so we can consolidate on using one item. Um, actually, the first few weeks, we found that some of the uh, product numbers were replicated up to as much as four different uh, instrument set descriptions and going in and cleaning that out. That's, that's a lot easier if, if you have a digital picture where you can seek out um, redundancies going in from the instrument level instead of just talking to staff. Because if you're using the same instrument at the emer uh, emergency reception area and at an operating room or in a clinic, there's no reason that this product shouldn't be the same product across all three places in a lot of instances. So that, could, that helps us reduce the number of uh, assets that we actually have in stock because we can move them around between uh, different uh, areas of need. Yeah, and as I said, we would like better support for, for mobile storage. And then we would like to introduce what we call single cycle items. Because when we add the traceability down to the instrument level, we don't need the tedious work of returning an instrument set for instrument sets with few instruments. So actually, we would like to uh, uh, end up in a situation where you just send back your instruments, and then we just produce a new instrument set and delivers that because that's the, the cheapest way for the operating staff to work. And when you get the instruments back into the CSSD, well, when they scan the instruments, they know which products are missing and where should you add these products to. I believe we are at the end of the slides. Is that correct? Yes. Thank you for listening. Um, this has been a lot of information and uh, my recommendations to you and my view on this is actually, and the reason why I don't mention that many GS1 standards is that it's a matter of context with standards to choose. And I urge you to, if you want to take on a project like this, contact your, your, your local membership office and get them on board to, to get them to help to see which cases from all over the world can you use to be inspired and perhaps to copy. We have uh, we've looked very deeply into cases from France, Holland, Japan, before we started marking the, the, the individual instruments and they have much more knowledge than I can present to you in 35 minutes. Okay, so thank you very much, Henrik, for this great and com comprehensive presentation. Um, I, I have seen that it's very highly complex project. It is, it, it has taken more than five years, but uh, we can see here, I think the importance of having real time and quality data in the support processes uh, for patient safety. So um, now we're going to move to the question and answer session. I will kindly ask you, Harry, to be as brief as possible by answering yeah. the questions as we have a lot of them on the chat. And if we are not on time to answer all the questions, I will also ask you if you can answer it uh, and before, after, sorry, after the, after the webinar and we can send the answers to, to our attendees. So yeah. the first question on the chat is, would you see any role for FHIR interoperability that stands for fast health interoperability resources? 
Um, yeah, we're talking about the HL7 standard, is that correct? Yeah. Well, we're actually using that to get the uh, um, the information about which uh, which surgeries are booked each day. So we are already using that from our electronic health record to get the um, overview of which patients and which surgeries are to be done each day. And that's then combined with uh, the demand for different uh, resources. So we're using that and that's a very, uh, that's been a very powerful tool for us. Thank you, Henry. Uh, there's a question regarding the demand and capacity you have mentioned. So can you elaborate uh, on how you are able to detect demand and capacity challenges in day-to-day -day operations? Well, um, actually we use it, uh, if you you can imagine the, um, the, the theater where you have a, a, a different set of seats, we have what we uh, call an, um, uh, a blocking period on each side of an operation. So if we book a set of uh, uh, supplies for an operation, it takes out space in the theater for a given time. And then we look um, across the, the number of the instruments that, that are required and see, are we receiving them back from the operating rooms to be able to run the next show actually. And that's when we make the red markings because we have an expectancy of what's going to happen tomorrow or in a few hours. And if we are running behind an instrument, well, then we try to mitigate that either by uh, fast tracking the process or which what we don't like to do, replanning uh, surgery. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. So now we have some questions related to the marking of the instruments. Yeah. Uh, we're going to formulate all the three questions together. What 10% of your instruments have been uh, it's marked, what were the challenges and how long does it take to mark each instrument? So three questions for you, Henry. Yeah. Um, and try to, I'll come back if the, the, the answer is not entirely correct, but uh, by now I believe we have about 25% uh, of the instruments marked uh, in this way. And uh, we are primarily using it for things that are delivered one, two, or three pieces together, because the larger sets and systems are usually well handled and don't benefit that much from uh, from single item tracking. Uh, that was the first question. What was the second? Yeah. What were the challenges you're facing? With, uh... Uh, the challenge was actually figuring out how can we do that without destroying the instruments, uh, and could we really train? staff uh, in using these methods and uh, and we went all over Europe to find the partners to help us uh, to to achieve that and um, we have a, a few very well educated people who uh, who understand to how to make this process simple because what we found out is that it's it's about identifying the surface where you can mark something and calibrating the system to make the marking and then the lasers will do the work for you in the system that we have chosen. And, and related um, to related to this, uh, well, there is a question. It says, how how long does it take to mark each instrument? I, I guess it will depend on the uh, technique well, you the, are choosing. Yeah, it also just depends on how uh, how complex an instrument is it to mark. So if, if you, most of you probably works with instruments every day, so you know that they come in all size and shape, shapes and sizes. So if you have a, a pair of medicine bound scissors, that's a fairly easy task to do, and you can perhaps do uh, more than uh, you can do several of them per per hour. But if you you have uh, the larger robot equipment as well, well, you need to uh, take more care, and you, the handling is lower. So uh, from my point of view. If, if you know how much handling time you have on the instruments when you are cleaning it, well, add that by a factor of uh, some, somewhere between five and 10, well, then that, that, could, that would be the actual work to, uh, being done on the marking. So it's not, that's not the expensive part. The problem for us was actually being able to take the instruments out of the flow and have time to mark them because they are in 
high demand all the time. So planning is actually the, the, the most difficult part. It's not yeah. the, the marking itself is, is, is fairly fast. Thank you. Next questions regarding the uh, identifiers, the things that the carriers, uh, the question is, uh, who is providing these data carriers uh, to the train eaters, items and assets? Who is providing? Well, if we, if it's something that we own uh, and it doesn't come with a UDI marking, well, then, uh, then, then we go in and use our company prefix to 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 do the marking, and uh, because of that, we're using a global individual asset identifier for for the marking that we're doing, not to to make sure that we don't mix up. Uh, different identification standards. And one of the things that's very important for us there is um, that we only have one barcode on each item. In some situations, we have more barcodes, but that's when GS1 recommendations tells us that it's a good idea to replicate the same data value on different points at the same asset. And I, I, I like not to go too much into which uh, asset track, it, uh, which marking technology we use, because I, I went through that uh, in the uh, uh, webinar that I referred to, and it's a, a quite a long story to, to, to go into that. Okay, thank you. Here we have, uh, well, congratulations from our colleague from Ireland, Fergal uh, McGrorthy. Maybe you know him directly. Yeah, I know. Thank, Says thank you for that. Best Fantastic work, Henrik. I assume management needed to take a leap of faith when this project was proposed and you look for funding. How did you convince them that there would be a good uh, return of investment, both financial process and safety? And did you have to educate them on just one or was that necessary? That was a lot of questions. Um... A lot. I will repeat uh, it if needed. First, first of all, um, we like to turn things around. So, so, so we didn't go out and say, well, you'll, uh, you'll get this benefit from using the DS1 standards to do this. We, we turned it around and said, well, if you don't use the DS1 standards, you have to handle a business model for traceability. And you have to find out how you would communicate to actors who are not from our hospital, because we, we, we like to think of our supply chain as something that goes that starts before the hospital and ends after the hospital, uh, especially with these sustainability requirements that we have today. So, so it was back to uh, actually uh, doing a lot of checks and balances here and, and finding out what would the cost be of not doing this. And we had a lot of experience from the traceability in all who, so we, so we didn't have to convince uh, the management in Gerstrup that it was easy to introduce a traceability because we had shown that for, for tens of thousands and items uh, before and um, and actually they themselves are very aware that by building this large hospital and cutting off the possibility to talk about problems and to handle things by phone or just by being at the same location they needed to have a digital representation of what was going on. And um, I, I, I like to put it uh, uh, in that way that we are a bit lazy. If someone has done something before and it's, it's, it's usable in our environment, we don't, don't really like to go out and invent stuff again. And again, we started out when we started these uh, strategies together with a lot of uh, retail experts because they, for some reason, they are much better at getting the, the stuff to the shelves at the right time that we were when we started back 12, 15 years ago. So, so we're just copying. Uh, and, and, and by doing that, we have the cases that, that tells the story of a good return on investment for this part. And actually, the marking and, and the basic part of the tracking is not that expensive. That's not, that's not the expensive part. The expensive part is designing the flow to support the heavy load of information that you put into it. Because it's it's very easy to just throw information at staff and then they don't really get better at what they do. The, the, diff, the difficult part 
is to sort out how little can you uh, can you use, how little information is enough for each step so you keep up pace and you keep up quality that's a difficult part and that takes a lot of a lot of doing things wrong I, I just go out and try it uh, in a small scale environment and find out what works best for you thank you Henrik, for this huge and explanation uh, we are running out of time so let me ask you as we have started some some minutes late as well let me ask you a final uh, question and as there are some others on the chat i will send it to you if you're okay with this after the sure, webinar yeah. and if you can just mm -hmm. answer it will be really kind mm -hmm. so my last question for you today is from bo Danielson. it says nice presentation so thank you congratulations thank you. The question mm -hmm. is your staff order instruments. Do you record those which were not needed in order to give feedback to staff? Yes, we uh, we record which uh, instruments are returned uh, unused and which instruments uh, are returned uh, used. Also, it's very important for us to do that because we have uh, time limits on the used instruments for several surgeries where we need to handle them within a given time. And there's no need to to put these uh, timers and warnings on instruments that hasn't been used. So it's it's bo uh, both a, a question of uh, keeping up capacity as well as keeping costs down. Okay, so thank you. Thank you so much, Henrik, for this webinar, for the uh, explanations, for answering those questions. I will send you the remaining questions on the chat. And unfortunately, the time has run out very quickly today. So I would like to thank you for sharing your experience today, your knowledge with all of us today, for enlightening us with real evidence on how uh, we can add value to the sterile good supply chain, which is an important and critical area in all hospitals. Um, I would also like to give a special thanks to our colleague Jasper from G1 Denmark for your endless support and for bringing this project to a global audience. And of course, uh, to all of you uh, for your attendance today. Last but not least, I would like to announce the date of next webinar, which will take place April 27. So please book it in your diaries. Thank you very much for your interest in this webinars and we will continue to learn and to share many more success stories very soon. Please stay tuned. Thank you and good evening.